This is the story of a little known battle south of the border and the two troops of the U.S. Cavalry who fought it. The battle should probably never have been fought. Captain Boyd, the U.S. commander, was given orders not to engage Mexican forces at all. Yet, that is exactly what he did. Now, by all accounts, Boyd was an experienced officer who would not exceed his orders. There is speculation that Boyd was given verbal orders to create an incident that would create a situation which would justify the U.S. going to war with Mexico. Whatever the reason, Boyd and the officers and men of the 10th U.S. Cavalry, the Buffalo Soldiers, did their duty. It was the Battle of Carrizal. Now, Pancho Villa's raid on the town of Columbus, New Mexico on March 9, 1916, forced President Wilson's hand in dealing with the problems along the southern border. Small bands of armed Mexicans had been crossing the border and raiding settlements for some time. It became so bad that Wilson ordered troops to the border to guard against these raids. But this was not Villa's first act of aggression against the United States. Previous January, Villa's men had stopped a train at Santa Isabella in the state of Chihuahua. They forced 19 mining engineers from the American Smelting and Refining Company to get off the train. Then they shot them all. One was able to survive and tell the story. After the Columbus raid, President Wilson ordered the U.S. Army to enter Mexico, track down Villa, and to kill or capture him. General John J. Persing was given command of the Mexican expedition. That's a division, basically 4,800 men. It was also known as the Punitive Expedition. Now, on the morning of March 15, 1916, Pershing's Eastern Column crossed the border into Mexico, and then accompanying the Western Column, Pershing entered Mexico on the morning of the 16th of March. By 7.30 p.m. that night, Pershing established his headquarters at Colonna Dublan, that's approximately 115 miles south of Columbus, New Mexico. Now, that was going to be the main supply base for his exposition. Over the next few months, several carefully coordinated cavalry columns pressed southward through the state of Chihuahua in an effort to locate Villa, while trying to avoid confrontation with troops loyal to the Mexican government, who were unhelpful at best and often hostile. Now, there were several engagements with Vista forces and Mexican troops, but Villa had evaded the Americans. Reports would come in to Pershing's headquarters that Villa was sighted in a village or in the mountains somewhere. Cavalry troops would go forth to investigate, but would always come up empty-handed. One such scouting expedition was sent out on June 16th to check on Mexican troop buildups around the village of Ahumada. That's yeah, about 115 miles east of Colonna Dublin, as the crow flies. Captain Charles T. Boyd, 10th U.S. Cavalry, was in command of C Troop, along with Hank Adair as his lieutenant. He was given orders to recon in the vicinity of Santa Domingo Ranch, but to avoid any clashes with Mexican forces. Similar orders were issued to Captain Louis S. Maury, 10th Cavalry Commander of K Troop. There is evidence that Boyd was given verbal orders to create an incident. Estimates vary on the number of troops Boyd had under his command. Some say 80 troops. The men who were in the battle said they only had about 50 men on the firing line. Now, the two columns converged on the Santa Domingo Ranch. That's about 60 miles east of Colonna Dublin on the evening of June 20th. The ranch foreman informed Captain Boyd that a large Mexican troop had been gathering at Ahumad. Boyd decided he had to confirm, confirm this intelligence personally. Now, to get to the village of Ahumad, Boyd would have to go through the small Mexican village of Carazel. That was about 20 miles southwest of his objective. As dawn broke, the soldiers of C and K troop mounted up and headed for Villa Amahudad via Carazel. At the outskirts of Carazel, Boyd's column was stopped by Mexican troops. Boyd could see that the main body of the Mexican force was deployed in present defensive positions behind a row of cottonwood trees along the stream bed, as well as in the village itself. The Mexican commander, who rode out to intercept Boyd and his men before they could enter the village, informed Boyd his orders stated he was not to allow American troops to advance any further. They couldn't go east, south, or west. The only direction the American force could move was north. Boyd replied that his orders required that he and his troops pass through Carrizal. 
Boyd and a small group of men returned to the rest of the troop. Corporal Houston of K Company, in his account of the battle, recounted in the June 30th edition of the El Paso Herald, what Captain Boyd said to his command upon returning from the negotiations. Men, we have orders to go east and reconnoiter Amahudad, and in order to do that, we shall go through this town, and the Mexican colonel told me his general refused us permission to pass through the town. Boyd then said, Boys, this looks fine. The general says the only direction we can travel is north. My orders are to travel east to Amahudada, which is 18 miles on the other side of this town, and I'm going through this town and take all you men with me. The orders were given, the troops cheered, then moved forward, deployed in a line of forages. 1st Platoon of C Troop and 2nd Platoon of K Troop were to move through the town and drive the Mexicans out. Guarding the left flank was the 2nd Platoon of C Troop commanded by Lieutenant Adair and guarding the right flank was 1st Platoon of K Troop under the command of Captain Maury. 500 yards from the enemy, the command was given to dismount and move forward on foot. In an interview with the El Paso Herald excuse me, on June 30, 1916, Lem Spilsbury, a civilian interpreter for Boyd's command, recounted the battle. At 200 yards, the Mexicans opened fire with machine guns. The command was given to lie down in the road and return fire. The troops desperately tried to dig holes in the dirt with their rifle butts. It was a waste of effort. The machine gun fire was closing in on them. Luckily, the Mexican machine gunners were inexperienced and could not accurately aim their weapon. The Americans were greatly outnumbered. Estimates put the Mexican force at about 150 men. The enemy was so close though that the Americans were able to hit their targets easily. But so were the Mexican machine gunners. They were getting the range. Captain Boyd ordered his men to rush the machine guns. Now the Americans would shoot, then charge, then drop, reload, fire, then charge again. It was during this second rush that Sergeant Ferrier was wounded, as well as Captain Boyd. He was hit in the right hand. While the men under Boyd's command were moving forward under heavy fire, trying to make it to the irrigation ditch in front of the Mexican lines, both of Boyd's flanks were being enveloped by Mexican cavalry. Troop, C, uh, advanced forced them, Troop C's advance forced the Mexican defenders to retreat. Now, during the third rush, Corporal Hammond and Sergeant Wills were able to take out uh, one of the machine guns. The other had been overrun. However, Captain Boyd was hit a second time, this time in his shoulder. For an hour and a half, the men of the 10th Cavalry fought on. The odds were against them. They were outnumbered and outgunned. Spilsbury was about 20 yards behind Boyd when he saw, saw him get hit in the shoulder. Corporal Houston and two men helped get Boyd into the irrigation ditch. The round exposed the collarbone, and the wound was bleeding profusely. Now, the rest of Boyd's men were rallying around him, ready to fight to the last. Boyd instructed Sergeant Farion to order K Troop to move forward. Boyd also stood up, waving his hat, to signal K Troop to advance, and it was at that moment that Boyd was shot in the head. It was reported that he told his, his men just before he died, I'm done for, boys. You'd better make your getaway. Sergeant Peter Bigstaff, Troop C, and First Lieutenant Rodney Adair, fighting from the cover of the irrigation ditch, were vainly trying to hold back the onslaught of Mexican troops. Adair's revolver was shot out of his hand. Bigstaff quickly slapped another one into the lieutenant's hand. Shooting and shooting and shooting while trying to fend off the attacking troops and slimming down that number, they were running out of ammunition. Adair attempted to get over to the First, to first Sergeant Winrow's platoon, to get ammunition. He was shot to pieces as he tried to cross the irrigation ditch. His last order to Big Staff was to leave him and save his own life. Big Staff fought his way out and could have kept going, but he looked back and saw Lieutenant Adair had collapsed into the water. Going back was suicide, but that's exactly what Big Staff did. He fought his way to the ditch, lifted Adair out of the water, and stayed with him until he died. The left and right flanks were collapsing. Mexican cavalry had gotten behind the American lines and were pressing their attack. Captain Maury's platoon on the right flank was being hit hard. Corporal Houston said, Maury yelled out to Sergeant Page, Sergeant Page, good God, man, 
There they are, right upon you. Page replied, I see, Captain, but we can't stop them. And we can't stay here because it's getting too hot. Maury ordered a retreat. They fought their way back to the cover of an adobe wall next to a dry hole. Maury started with 36 men. By the time they reached the cover of the adobe wall, he only had seven men left, and he was wounded in the shoulder. Now, the safety of the adobe wall was only temporary. 300 yards to the south, the Mexican troops were advancing on Maury's position. Surveying the situation, Maury calmly told his men that he intended to stay and fight, but any man who wished to could leave. Four men chose to leave. Maury said they didn't run, they just walked out and headed up the hill, almost as if in a daze. Maury credits those four men with saving his life. The Mexicans didn't know how many men had taken refuge behind that wall. So when they saw four men trying to escape, they went after them and never bothered to check behind the wall. By this point in the battle, it was every man for himself. After Boyd released his men to scatter, Corporal Houston decided he'd have a better chance on his own. He headed west to a chain of mountains, approximately 12 miles away. He hadn't gotten 200 yards when a bullet hit the ground close behind him. Turning to see how many Mexicans were chasing him, Houston saw Corporal Queen signaling him to wait. The two men left the battlefield at 10 a.m. They reached the mountains at about 1.30 p.m. However, in the hot blazing sun with no cover and no water, the men were dehydrating quickly. They marched across the mountain range all afternoon. By dusk, they were ready to give up. As they crested the top of the mountain they were climbing, they saw trees in the distance. They were about 18 miles away. Now, in that section of Mexico, trees meant water. They marched on through the night, determined to reach the trees and water. Both men, exhausted and dehydrated, began staggering along, half unconscious. They became separated. Houston kept going, but after a few miles, he just collapsed. The physical exertion took its toll. When dawn came, Houston, near death, but he was alive, woke up, and saw that the trees were only about four or five miles away. He pushed on, determined to get to the water. He covered that last mile with renewed energy. The trees he was heading for was actually the La Salado Ranch. When he arrived at the ranch, Corporal Queen was there to greet him. After resting for a few hours and purchasing food and a horse from the ranch, the men set out for Ojo Frederico. They hiked until about 11 p.m. when they made camp for the night. The next morning, to their surprise, they found three horses from my company grazing nearby. They were able to ride those horses to Rio Santa Maria, and an hour after they arrived, they, found a, they were found by a patrol from M Troop. Houston Queen had survived and made it back to base. After the Mexican soldiers went after Mari's three troopers heading into the hills, Captain Maury and his, his three men laid low behind the adobe wall all day, waiting for darkness. They had no water, no food, and little in the way of ammunition. The Mexicans were all around looking for more American invaders. Once nightfall came, the wounded Maury led his troopers west on a 70-mile march. Now, due to his wound and the loss of blood, Maury could only walk about 100 yards at a time, then he'd collapse. He realized he was unable to continue. Mari told his men to leave him. To a man, they refused. There was no way they were going to leave their lieutenant to be captured or worse, to die in the God-forsaken desert. Mari gave the men his compass, a telegram to his wife, his final report for General Pershing, then ordered his men to leave him. Miraculously, by sheer force of will, he got to his feet and guessing the best direction to travel, he stumbled towards Santa Domingo Ranch, eight miles away. Walking all day and into the next morning, Maury reached the ranch house at about 4.30 a.m. The ranch was deserted. The manager, J.T. McCabe, had fled. Maury's only source of water at the ranch was a mud hole. After drinking just enough stagnant water to gain strength, Maury searched the adobe ranch house. McCabe had fled the ranch so quickly that he left behind beefsteak, coffee, and cornbread. After eating and taking what food he could, Maury continued his march to safety. Not far from the ranch, Maury came across five troopers who had also managed to escape. Well, they went back to the ranch to get provisions. 
the men stuffed their pockets with whatever food there was, filled their canteens. After a 10 mile hike, the men came across McCabe, the ranch foreman. He had a wagon and a mule. Maury and his men made it. They rode the rest of the way to San Luis Ranch, where a squadron from the 11th Cavalry was able to escort them back to base. The fate of the men who were captured was harsh. The Mexican soldiers stripped them of their uniforms and valuables. Lem Spilsbury stated that the Mexican soldiers were shooting wounded. This accusation has never been verified, but other POWs said they heard the Mexicans shooting wounded men. Now the POWs were taken to Ahumada, where they were held in the local jail for a number of days until arrangements were made for reparation. The Mexican population was stirred up. They wanted revenge for the death of General Gomez. He was the commander of the village of Carrizal. As the American POWs were being herded onto the train that would take them to Juarez for reparations, the civilians crowded around and began screaming, death to the Yankees, death to the Yankees. Luckily, the POWs were able to board the train and escape that fate. Now, the POWs reached the International Bridge in El, in El Paso on Thursday, June 29, 1916. The formal exchange of prisoners took place in the middle of the bridge. Even though they were ragged, dirty, wounded, unwashed, and wearing an assortment of clothes, the POWs formed in ranks of two and marched to the center of the bridge, as if on the parade ground. They were flanked on each side by a column of Mexican soldiers, which the Opaso Herald stated had to try to keep up with their prisoners. I don't know if that's true or not, you know, reporters. Anyways, General George Bell, United States Army, was at the center of the bridge to meet the returning POWs. As he called off each name, the soldiers stepped forward, gave a smart salute to the general and his staff, then crossed the line to freedom. The massive crowd that gathered on the American side cheered as each soldier came home. The American losses during this battle were 12 killed, 11 wounded, 24 captured. The Mexican forces lost 24 to 45 killed, 43 wounded. The men of the 10th Cavalry acquitted themselves bravely against 3 to 1 odds. The Buffalo Soldiers, Troop C and K, were back home. Corporal Houston and Queen were commissioned captains during World War I. Captain Queen rose to the rank of Colonel and commanded the 366 Infantry Regiment, 92nd Division during World War II. Sergeant Pete Bigstaff, he retired from the Army and lived peacefully in Lexington, Kentucky. The aftermath of the Battle of Carrizal was an international incident, but there were no military interventions into Mexico. The border raids would continue for another four years. Now to combat these raids, President Wilson nationalized the National Guard, and these troops were rotated through border duty to gain experience. And it did give the Guard valuable training experience they would need when the U.S. entered the war in Europe in April 1917. The expedition was never able to capture Pancho Villa. However, they did manage to weaken Villa's rebel forces considerably. January 1917, the punitive expedition crossed back over the border into the United States, effectively ending operations in Mexico. But this did cause some issues with Mexican-American relations for the next hundred years. It's our history. It's our heritage. We need to remember this. Well, thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you liked it, please hit the subscribe button, leave a comment below, and ring the bell. Thank you very much. I post a new video every two weeks.